democracy that has had to take a different role now in creating awareness at the government level in terms of cybersecurity threats and issues, um, causing, uh, creating fora to allow government ministers and um, government officials to discuss the issues that are taking place. Uh, the Organization of American States also has an inter-American committee against terrorism, CICTE, and they've been playing a leading role in pulling stakeholders together now across different groups bringing law enforcement officers with members of the judiciary together with members of the technical community to look at issues of uh, combating cyber crime and dealing with strengthening cyber security. Uh, another interesting stakeholder in the middle of all of this is a Caribbean Network Operators Group or CARIBNOG. Now network operators groups are volunteer technical communities and in countries where they are not strong or very well developed national institutions or organizations to deal with um, with cyber issues, NOGs represent a really good way of um, taking a first step at understanding, assessing, and defining a strategy for cyber security. So in the region, Carib NOG is taking and uh, playing its part there. Now NOGs are made up of network operators and members of the technical community who would have almost a first responder type position to looking at threats to national networks and, and anomalies at the regional level. Uh, law enforcement initiatives are also key where um, they, the nexus between uh, security forces at the policing level uh, and their connection to government policy makers becomes important. And so inside of all of this with these key stakeholders one main issue is awareness. Just breaking past the ignorance barrier, the, the lack of understanding that exists at several levels in terms of, well, what is a cyber crime? Uh, is it a crime if our books don't recognize it as one? How do we follow activity that is not started in our jurisdiction and may not even end in our jurisdiction, but we are facilitating because our systems are open? Uh, these are the kinds of, of discussions that are taking place now um, and getting uh, raising a lot of, of question marks over how the business of security is, is currently conducted. So from a, a development of a strategy standpoint, there, there are four issues that I just want to, to highlight or bullet point that are uh, being looked at as a, a framework for cybersecurity strategy development. One, the issue of national ICT infrastructure. Uh, particularly in countries where there is no um, robust domestic internet infrastructure, this becomes very important. Looking at the establishment of an internet exchange point as a, a way to exchange local traffic, local internet traffic, setting up or, or digitally signing the, the CCTLD or country domain name uh, with DNSSEC, uh, one of the security protocols that helps protect domain names online. Um, locating root servers within country to help mitigate against threats like denial of service attacks. Uh, the issue of national ICT infrastructure is one of the key issues in defining a cybersecurity strategy. Secondly, developing organization support. Um, this could be as simple as setting in place a cyber crime unit and determining where that unit is located in the scheme of things, but it can also get into the more complex development of interagency collaborations that bring stakeholders together to look constantly at how cyber issues are being treated with. Uh, thirdly, enhancing capacity development. And this is where, again, the, the work of groups like um, NOGS uh, comes in, but also the, the work of organizations that have a vested interest, like Packet Clearinghouse, in building uh, local capacity to respond to cyber issues and internet development generally. Um, as it relates to cybersecurity, I should point out that this also has um, one key area inside of building capacity is computer forensics and looking at how do you actually detect when a, an electronic threat is before you and how do you respond to it. And then of course the last issue is your legislation, ensuring that the uh, legislation at a country level is modernized but also ensuring that it makes provision for treating with um, criminal activity that can go beyond your own borders. Uh, 
the Caribbean faces some of the challenges that I think most regions face in terms of how do you address cybercrime, capacity, having right resources, funding, and the absence of a clear or specific roadmap uh, for moving from less than optimal preparedness to full and proper defenses of cyber borders. I just want to leave you with four steps that we're looking at now in terms of how we are, we are, we are treating with governments uh, in, most, in the developing world. This is packet clearing house. Four steps for um, dealing with defending cyber borders. One, raising public awareness and education. Uh, that's key. Uh, the issue of creating or, or engineering a cultural and mental shift is one of the most important aspects of treating with and defending against cyber attacks and, and criminal activity online. Uh, public awareness has to be deliberate and it has to involve not just the technical community but the media, uh, government officials making statements and of course practices within organizations that help uh, strengthen and, and make more robust use of the, the internet. Step two, develop appropriate policy, legal and regulatory frameworks for addressing cybercrime. This is something that you'll hear often, but for each country and for each region, it has to be tailored to meet the specific requirements of the jurisdiction. Step three, build cross-border collaborations to combat cybercrime. I can't say this often enough. Collaboration is critical to defending in the digital age. Uh, this, these threats pay no attention to national borders or to agency boundaries or to organizational uh, lines getting the relationships between people who need to work together established is fundamental to addressing cyber uh, defense and cyber stra and building a cyber strategy and this can be this can take many forms um, the key thing is to ensure that people build real relationships so that when issues take place someone can pick up the phone and call and um, and find somebody on the other line who understands and more importantly trusts that the advice given and the support lended is is what is required and lastly um, build out national um, suits or computer security incident response teams uh, and build out trusted network operator groups uh, volunteer communities where people can lend their expertise and their experience to guarding and defending against criminal activity okay. thank you Thank you very much, Bevel. Uh, now I'll turn to Kevin Bankston. Um, switching gears a, a little bit to um, sort of the domestic legislative situation in the U.S. and the role of um, the civil liberties community in that process, um, and then expanding that globally as well. <laughs> Thank you, Liesl, uh, and thank you for allowing me to be here to represent the views of the Center for Democracy and Technology, a nonprofit organization that's aiming to keep the Internet open, uh, innovative, and free. Uh, my comments will focus on protecting fundamental rights when formulating national and international cybersecurity policy, and uh, as a civil society representative, I'll also focus on the important role of civil society in doing so. Uh, there, there are admittedly serious serious threats to cybersecurity that require serious responses. However, when considering avenues for international cooperation in maintaining cybersecurity, CDT proceeds from the premise that in our pursuit of a more secure network, we must work equally hard to preserve fundamental human rights, especially the right to privacy and to free expression. Uh, ensuring that cybersecurity efforts are both effective and rights respecting requires collaboration from a wide range of stakeholders. Uh, cybersecurity policy formulation, whether national or international, is, if you'll allow me a metaphor, like a chair. Um, a chair rests on four legs. Uh, if one, e one of those legs is pulled out, it will fall. In the development of cybersecurity policy, I think the four key legs are obviously governments, companies, uh, technical experts, and civil society and human rights advocates. And so uh, we have a good chair in this room, actually. It's good to see all those sectors represented here. But as a representative of civil society, I want to focus uh, my remarks on the role of civil society. Um, actually, I, I am not a multi-stakeholder individual like Liesl. I have been in civil society uh, my entire career. Um, and so I do believe that the participation of civil society is a key ingredient in the formulation of, civil, of uh, cybersecurity policy. Civil society can contribute insights that may not be uh, apparent to industry or governments and ensure a proper accounting 
for human rights interests such as free expression and privacy. Uh, the civil society already obviously makes important contributions to the self-regulatory multi-stakeholder uh, and technical standard setting bodies that reflect the bottom-up nature of the internet uh, and that are the foundation of the internet's success today. Uh, and that should remain true in the cybersecurity arena. But uh, to ensure the participation of civil society, internet policy matters such as cybersecurity should be, we think, addressed uh, through transparent mechanisms that are inclusive of all interests, all four of the legs of the chair, as it were. Um, CDT's particular experience in this area dealing with cybersecurity legislation in the U.S., uh, I think can perhaps illustrate the contribution that civil society can uh, play in, in securing the Internet in a way that is rights-respecting. Cybersecurity information sharing in particular uh, poses a conundrum, a very difficult problem, because the private sector information sharing between the private sector and the government is, is crucial to effective cybersecurity uh, and sharing between uh, companies as well, uh, but it could also be detrimental to privacy. Provider sees something on their network uh, that could be an attack or is an attack, and they it's, and they want to share that information with government or business. If that attack is is uh, it may be IP addresses or email addresses where the attack is coming from. It could be signatures of the attack, including content of private communications, um, signatures indicating the transmission of malware. But in the U.S., our current privacy law doesn't allow the disclosure of much of that information without the consent of the user, which has, uh, according to companies and government, posed some hindrance to cybersecurity policy. So uh, the U.S. Congress has been working to address this, but there are huge privacy risks. We are talking about personally identifiable information. We are talking about uh, the content of private communications. And if written poorly or broadly, an allowance for sharing of information of, of cybersecurity related information uh, to the government could essentially become a backdoor wiretapping program allowing the use of a broad swath of information for purposes wholly other than cybersecurity. Uh, this risk is even higher if we're talking about uh, disclosure of information to military as opposed to civilian agencies. Uh, we do believe that civilian control of cybersecurity uh, helps promote transparency and accountability uh, to the public for failure or abuse whereas military authorities often are much less transparent and accountable to the public. So earlier this year, in the U.S., civil society experts played, I think, a constructive role in attempting to resolve this information sharing problem uh, in the context of the Cybersecurity Act in the U.S. Senate, um, legislation that was introduced in, in the Senate of our, our Congress. Um, working with policymakers, companies, and technologists, civil society experts, backed up by an internet activist community that's newly energized after the defeat of SOPA and PIPA uh, to copyright um, laws that were at issue in uh, the U.S. To, uh, last year, were able to obtain changes to this Cybersecurity Act, which, when it was introduced, was very dangerously and broadly drafted to allow a great deal of information sharing without clear limitation. Um, we were able to restrict sharing of information to only civilian agencies. Um, we were able to obtain strict limits on what types of information could be shared, uh, specific categories of cyber threat indicator information, uh, and also requiring companies to take reasonable efforts to strip out unnecessary identifying data. Um, got restrictions on what types of investigations the information could be used for, uh, primarily only cybersecurity, uh, with a few small exceptions. And the bill, uh, as amended, based on civil society's input, uh, made clear that engaging in protected free expression in, in the U.S., expression protected by our First Amendment, did not constitute a cybersecurity threat warranting disclosure of information to the government. Um, finally, we were able to get annual reports from a number of different agencies in our government in this bill uh, that would describe what information was given to the government, how it was used, um, so that we would have some level of accountability. Um, in essence, many of these changes that we sought and obtained in the bill, uh, which will be coming back up likely in our Senate after the election tomorrow, um, were, were ways of uh, attempts to implement the fair information practices principles of collection limitation, uh, purpose specification, 
uh, accountability and auditing. And I think that if, if protections like these are built into the information sharing aspects of international cybersecurity programs, they are much more likely to be accepted by the public, to be trusted and, and be effective. They're also, importantly, and less likely to lead to cybersecurity efforts that enable or become an excuse for unwarranted violations of the right to privacy or free expression. Uh, our experience working on the Cybersecurity Act is, in the United States does suggest that cybersecurity policy can best be set through open processes that involve civil society. Um, in contrast, pardon me. In contrast, uh, CDT is is concerned by the possibility of the International Telecommunication Union attempting to set cybersecurity policy as as some member states have proposed. If you go to our website and visit the ITU resources page there, you can find our paper on the subject. I also have a couple of handouts uh, up here if you'd like to see some of our work on that. As an initial matter, we're concerned that the process of the revision of the international telecommunication regulations has not been sufficiently inclusive and transparent to ensure the development of just and effective cybersecurity policy, despite some recent and appreciated efforts to facilitate more public participation. On this point, regarding how to make the ITU process more open, I, I urge you to look at a joint statement uh, to the ITU and its member states that was agreed to this weekend here in Baku by a broad range of global civil society uh, from across the globe at something called the Best Bits meeting. And you can see this statement at bestbits.igf-online.net. We're concerned that the proposals on the table at the ITU right now don't account for the complexity of the cybersecurity issues at hand or the impact of cybersecurity policy on fundamental rights. Given the rapidity with which cybersecurity threats evolve, and because much of the Internet's critical infrastructure is privately owned and operated, treaty-based bodies such as the ITU are likely not the ideal source of technical solutions. Instead, effective solutions to the cybersecurity threat can likely only be reached through multi-stakeholder processes involving technical experts, academics, and human rights advocates, as well as government officials and network operators. Making cybersecurity a part of the ITU treaty the ITU's treaty could distract from or undermine efforts already underway by other international bodies that we think are more capable of addressing cybersecurity concerns and developing security standards, including governmental efforts such as the uh, Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime, uh, non-governmental voluntary standard bodies such as the IETF, uh, specialized multi-stakeholder coalitions like the Configur Working Group, and other efforts like the NOGs that Bevel mentioned, including Carib NOG. Um, Rather than amending the ITRs to include references to cybersecurity, we think all stakeholders, including the ITU, who, as Bevel says, can play a key role in raising awareness about security is cybersecurity issues, should focus on strengthening the consensus-driven multi-stakeholder models under which the Internet has developed and under which it continues to flourish, uh, including the forum we're attending today, uh, where I thank you for allowing me to speak uh, and look forward to a continuing dialogue on these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. That's one of the mo most succinct and clear descriptions of the congressional process <laughs> that I've heard. Um, so thank you. Um, uh, and last but not least, certainly, Andrew Cushman from Microsoft. Give us about 10 minutes, and that will give us about, or less, whatever you choose. Um, but that will give us about 30 minutes of our time for um, some good interaction, I hope, from all of you. So please be thinking of your questions, and we welcome them, of course, from the remote participants as well. Do we have any remote participants participate? Oh, well, then never mind. Maybe they'll join. Um, so be thinking of uh, questions for our panelists while, uh, and while you're listening intently to Andrew. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you today about uh, cybersecurity, uh, operationalizing that uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, I work at Microsoft Corporation. I've been there about uh, 20 plus years. I've had a uh, career in four different careers. I've had a career in development where I was actually working on localized consumer software. I worked on uh, back office software. That's the web server that ships with Windows Server. And I worked on the teams that uh, were that responded to NIMDA and Code Red, the very first uh, mass worms on the, on the Internet. Uh, I joined the security team about a decade ago and focused on 
uh, hacker outreach. So when thinking about collaboration, that's uh, Microsoft collaborating with an audience uh, that in some ways had very different views than uh, Microsoft at that point. Uh, it was a very valuable uh, activity for us. I also managed the Microsoft Security Response Center, uh, which is the team that is responsible for the monthly updates, the security updates that come uh, every month on the second Tuesday. Uh, those updates go out to 1.3 billion users around the world. And today, those are delivered like clockwork. It used to be that people said, I'm not sure if I want to install that right away. I'm not sure if I can trust the quality. People now know. They are at the point where they know the quality of the code that's being delivered uh, is high and that they, they want that protection as soon as it is available. More recently, I have moved from a technical job to a policy job. And along the way, part of my career, I started in testing and then worked up to um, and in testing, we always had this, this notion that said, you want to test the specification. So that before the code gets written, you actually want to uh, test the assumptions in the design. Because it's much easier to fix the design than it is the, the code once it's written. I have a similar role today as it relates to cybersecurity policy. It's not about response for me anymore. Now it is about helping uh, governments, helping companies, helping institutions craft effective and implementable cybersecurity policy so that the intent actually uh, is delivered upon. In today's uh, brief comments, there are three major points that I want to make to you as you're thinking about uh, cybersecurity. One is that you must take a holistic approach to this problem. Liesl talked about whole of government. Well, you need to think about whole of society because we now are, we are no longer talking about internet adoption. We now talk about internet dependence. Similarly, with this holistic approach, you need to think about the whole life cycle from begin to end. How is it that you're going to manage uh, either the technical dimensions or the policy dimensions or the legal dimensions of cybersecurity? So the first point is about a holistic approach. Uh, the second point I would make is that you must partner to achieve the scope and the scale that are necessary for combating today's cybersecurity challenges. Because it isn't just one department and it isn't just one nation. Every speaker has talked about the, the international dimensions, the international aspect of cybersecurity. A little bit later, I'll highlight some, uh, some of the examples from my career at Microsoft that uh, how we have partnered for scope and scale. And then the, the third point that I would make is uh, related back to the first one. It's not about adoption, it's about dependence. Treat your investments in cybersecurity as you would any other key investment. If you're a business, this is key to your strategy. And if you're undertaking a, uh, an important strategic direction or shift, you make sure to fund that properly. You fund it with appropriate resources and you fund it for the long term so that there is a commitment. And you fund it with uh, appropriate research because cybersecurity, you're going to need to stay on top of this in order to not always be playing catch up. So from a scope and a scale perspective, uh, I mentioned earlier 1.3 billion users. That's all of Microsoft is actually firmly behind protecting those customers. But it's not just at a technical dimension, it's a, at a, it's a people, process, and technology that we talk about. 
and so we partner in educational efforts, children online safety, we partner with law enforcement, we partner with certs around the world for sharing information. We partner with other industry, part, uh, industry. so I uh, helped found an organization called ICASI, the Industry Consortium for Advancement of Security on the Internet. These are the incident response teams from Cisco and Juniper and IBM and Nokia and Amazon and Microsoft. If there's an emergency, if there's a critical vulnerability that impacts all vendors' products, we are on the phone and we have a process for how we manage that crisis. Recently, as I focus on uh, another dimension of the partnership is an organization called SafeCode uh, that works across industry to promote more secure development practices. And that is shared amongst industry, but it is also then shared across academia and shared with governments on here are how you would uh, help ensure that the software is more securely written. We partner with national bodies on certification. We partner with national bodies on and uh, organizations on developing new standards in the TCG, uh, on the TPM 2.0 spec. And as we move into this focus on policy, we will focus transnationally on how to enable, how to enact, and how to help promote effective and in implementable cybersecurity. I would agree with the last speaker that uh, the pace of change is rapid and that uh, there are problems when thinking about having the standard bearer for cybersecurity be a international organization that only has representatives of nation states. Two problems. One is that that completely ignores the capability of the private sector and secondly the pace of change and the pace of uh, the the, uh, the pace at which these organizations uh, affect change is not up to the pace of change in the cybersecurity arena. I'll leave with a couple of uh, operational points that you should uh, that I think are critical as you embark on this or as you think about this. The first is that you absolutely must plan ahead. You must have a plan for what happens when a cybersecurity incident happens, and you must also plan that it will happen to you. Don't think, oh, why would anybody, why would I be attacked? I don't have any plan for, uh, plan for the need for that to, uh, as mentioned earlier, communication and transparency are key. When I managed the Microsoft Security Response Center, an, a guiding principle was that there were no secrets, that any of the issues that I, were de that I was dealing with were going to become known, and that the best course of action was to, be, uh, was to communicate clearly and broadly and upfront and assume tra a transparent perspective, assume a transparent pers uh, position. And then lastly, I would say uh, collaborate. And I'll go back to my time interacting with the, with the hacker community as one of those that was transformative. So I was transparent with them, and I was honest and forthright. I was able to establish a, a dialogue and a trust relationship there that is paying dividends today I also listen to a community that, uh, while they come at the problem from a different perspective, have the same end goal, which is improved cybersecurity and a safe usage of ICT to continue 
to allow us to continue to innovate. With that, I will end my remarks and pass it back to Liesl for some questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, gentlemen, for uh, sharing with us in a very succinct way your experiences and expertise, um, which I, I hope um, all of you will agree provides a huge breadth of um, fodder for discussion. Um, and while we have you know, about 30 minutes now before the next sessions that I know everyone will want to go to, I think everybody is around for at least a little while. And, um, you know, so please don't hesitate to contact any of them in the course of the IGF for, for further discussion. But I think the next course of business is microphones, correct, for questions. So please raise your hand and uh, they'll bring a microphone to you. Um, and if you could, please identify yourself and... Uh, and uh, and your question, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Go ahead. Uh, hello, yeah, I can hear myself, so it must be working. Keep talking. Pardon? Is it working? Uh, yeah. Hey, there we go. Hi. Uh, my name is Alex Komninos. Uh, I'm from the Association for Progressive Communications uh, in the University of Gießen. Um, my question is for um, Gokhan. Um, and the, the question relates to the DDoS infrastructure that was it established for the test exercise. Um, that effectively amounts to a weapon of cyber mass destruction. I'm wondering what happened to that weapon uh, after the test exercise. Um, if any taxpayer's money goes into establishing a weapon, you know, citizens want to know where it is, what it's being used for. And I, I sincerely hope that it was uh, disarmed and demobilized. Thank you kindly. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, parts, of, parts of the uh, capacity was uh, hired from outer sources, and we hired some uh, we hired some servers uh, from other countries in order to. Uh, generate this traffic and uh, uh, part of this uh, capacity was uh, dismantled uh, I, I should say and part of the uh, capacity still exists almost half of it exists There is no. There, uh, he he asks uh, why does it still exist. Uh, there is no specific reason uh, because part of the uh, capacity was also uh, was already in our site, in our uh, authority, in our technical systems. I mean, therefore uh, it still exists and uh, it may be used in another exercise as well. Uh, I have already. Uh, uh, mentioned that we are uh, currently organizing another exercise. The uh, the theme of that exercise is not only DDoS attacks. It covers uh, different scenarios. It ha it covers different in uh, injections. Uh, but one of the uh, scenarios is uh, also DDoS attacks, and uh, it will be used uh, for for uh, simulating the uh, those attacks. Thank you. I think right here. Do you want to? Can you? Do you mind to pass the microphone to this lady in the front? Thank you. Keep talking. I can't hear. Yeah. It's we're not now. Sorry, there must be a magic to the microphone. <laughs> Okay, so I'm uh, Dr. Monal Ashkar. I'm uh, from the Lebanese University, which is a public university, and uh, I'm a head of uh, an NGO. At the same time, I'm the founder of the Pan Arab uh, Cybersecurity Observatory. So uh, I thank you all for this uh, precious information. And you can understand that when we talk about um, Pan Arab observatories, it means that we are concerned by every effort made uh, for cybersecurity, be it at the academic side or at the private or even at the public uh, 
And when hearing you, first of all, it's, I, I know that Turkey is not the only uh, country uh, with exercises to evaluate their system. Um, it's even their duty, their obligation to do this. But um, actually, whenever we do something with cybersecurity or even with technology in general, we feel that each step will generate another risk. And outsourcing is one of the risks, especially not, I'm not talking only for the private sector. I'm talking about governments. So I don't know if it could be a good example for others to follow. I mean, each country has to build his own resources and um, has to consider the responsibility, the liabilities that will be generated through whatever attacks done using what you have already developed. I don't know. That's one uh, thing. As, um, and um, I, I would like to know if you have ever uh, considered this. And um, as for Microsoft, uh, Microsoft and all the other industry. I w um, we have, uh, we all know that industry and uh, so tech uh, societies have um, are profiting uh, from the use and the dependence and all what is done in this field. And we know that this is an industry of risks. It's even more dangerous than what is done in aeronautics or even in uh, creating arms. So nobody's talking about responsibility or liability of these producers and their duty to do something. You are taking the initiative to help and to cooperate. It's okay. But what about the legal liability? This shall be considered not by you but by governments. And um, in the United States, you said that um, you uh, are a new department. New office in the department, office. just to be clear. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. So because they are uh, working since a while now, and uh, you discovered that um, cooperation or uh, centralization of efforts is necessary. Because you have had many problems, I think, due to um, not well organized efforts of the different departments. And we would like to know what do you think of this, especially that? I, well, I, th I think we've got a, quite a robust set of questions there, so let me just, um, perhaps I'll take on the U.S. for just a moment and, and then pass it on to Gokhan and others to, to address your other two questions. Just quickly to clarify, I did not use the word centralizing no, no, no. the information, about the, 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 the role in our office. In fact, the role of our office is coordination um, because there are so many roles. I mean, I, I think... I, 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 th I think Andrew's point of um, broadening the whole of government to whole of society is, is a great one. But if in, in my case, the office uh, is to coordinate with others. And, you know, frankly, first time in the Department of State having a, an outwardly facing role to interact with our counterparts in other countries. So I, I just want to be clear that it's not a centralizing no, role no, at all. No, I didn't all. say this. So I said you did, actually. You have, no, I said you had problems. You had holes gaps in your policy and in your defense policy. We always, we always did and we always will. <laughs> and we're trying to fix those. Uh, look, uh, we all know that um, events of uh, September was due somewhere to a gap in information sharing and information controlling and information. You know this. Of course. So, so. And this is due to some... Um, let's say, rivalries between okay. Department of State and not um, willing to share. So sharing and centralization of information could be okay. of so importance. I think that we've all talked about the need for coordination, collaboration, and information sharing. So why don't I pass it on to, to quick responses to any anybody that might have to her two questions. Okay. Uh, I agree. I agree with the risks of outsourcing. Uh, 
when when it comes to the systems of uh, or uh, information systems of uh, public sector or governments but uh, i have to make it clear i have to clarify one point we we didn't outsource anything during this exercise we just hired the servers the control of the servers were uh, was uh, in in our technical staff and uh, the owners of the servers didn't have any control over their servers yeah we, we just uh, hired the server and uh, installed relevant software on those servers in order to generate that traffic the uh, owners of the uh, machines or owners of those systems do do not even know uh, what uh, what w the purpose of uh, those servers uh, was and uh, what 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 were they were what they were used for <laughs> okay thank you anybody else okay um next in the room in the back and then perhaps we can move the microphone back up yeah i um this is zahid jamil i i'll sit down but I just want to respond to the query raised from from Lebanon. I believe it was an academic one. Um, I'm, I'm, I think it's it's an interesting idea that there are those who are, uh, as you I think you said, sort of risk producers, those who produce this risk, etc. Um, and what is their liability? So you you pointed to Microsoft, for instance. Uh, I'm concerned. Uh, I come from a developing country. I come from Pakistan, and we do a lot of outsourcing. We do a lot of development of software, etc. Uh, so the first of all, there are two points to my response. One is that um, these things are dealt with in contracts and big corporations and people, we're talking about businesses, when they negotiate these kind of contracts, deal with these issues within there. So if they don't want that particular software and they are supposed to do that due diligence, they actually have consultants come in and advise them on whether this software is safe or not, they should look at that issue. That, that would be one. But maybe that's not a complete solution. What really concerns me about your proposal of saying, look at liability before you even start to develop software is the following. Skype would never have started if the liability for Skype would be that they were enabling you know, criminal activity over the internet. Because the moment you do that, what happens is startups in developing countries, and let's not forget Skype was from not necessarily a developed country, would never reach because people, it would be a chilling effect on innovation. You will say, well, look, you know, I don't want to get into this because, first of all, I don't know what the liability is if I come up with this idea and then I market it. So I, from a developing country business perspective, I'd be really, really concerned. Perhaps, Zahid, could you maybe bring the microphone to the lady in the red shirt, please, and then the gentleman in the black jacket? I want to make sure we have time, I want to make sure we have time for uh, folks to ask questions. As I suggested, I think there's plenty of time for a lot of discussion to occur, but I want to make sure we get some some other questioners. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, I'm Malavika from the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore. Um, I had a question mainly directed at Kevin, which is, you know, national security in particular and cybersecurity as a part of it is kind of the ultimate answer to you know curtail all kinds of civil liberties it's it's the one argument you can't really fight and when civil society is actually trying to engage with government in implementing measures that are more protective of privacy and other civil liberties you're often given the whole oh you're you're anti-patriotic you're not concerned about national security um, are there tools that you can suggest when you engage with governments and when you engage with corporations to actually cut through this sort of zero-sum game of privacy versus security, whereas they needn't necessarily be two different things. You can have privacy and security. So do you have suggestions for how civil society engages with these issues without parsing it in such a binary kind of way? That is a difficult question that I'll answer as best I can. Uh, I think there are a couple of different ways to approach it. One is simply to to the extent you are able to make clear that you do have a sincere uh, and rational concern for the security of your nation. For example, 
I was in Lower Manhattan in New York on 9-11. I experienced that day along with many other horrified people. Um, I take the threat to our national security very seriously. I think there are very few who do not consider their national security to be an important uh, priority. But accepting that, I think that one of the key factors to bring up is effectiveness. Uh, looking at uh, past efforts, there are some indications that past in privacy invasive national security efforts, my biggest experience is with our national security agency's massive wiretapping program in the U.S., there are indications that that program did not actually help our national security. In fact, we have inspector general reports from our various agencies that many years later basically concluded that all the information sucked up by that program didn't actually lead to any effective anti-terrorism uh, action uh, and possibly actually made the issue harder by uh, simply creating more leads that led nowhere. In fact, uh, there were uh, FBI uh, law enforcement analysts who complained that they kept getting worthless leads. They started calling them the Pizza Hut leads. Pizza Hut is a uh, pizza delivery company in the United States, um, and, and often they were led to pizza delivery drivers because pizza delivery drivers often are getting calls from a lot of different people. I don't know. Anyway, uh, the point is that there is not a there is not a one plus one gathering more information does not always actually make national security better it may actually make it worse and so where there are hooks where you can argue that the policy will not be effective and may in fact be counterproductive that's usually the most productive uh, line of attack uh, or to the similarly one of the ways we were successful against SOPA and PIPA in the United States uh, certainly not a national security issue, um, but a similar tech policy issue, was bringing in tech technical experts to say, this effort to secure against copyright infringement will actually make the internet less secure. Uh, similarly, we've argued against uh, certain lawful intercept uh, policies and, and proposals in the U.S. by noting that if you build wiretap ability into various products, you're actually making those products more vulnerable to, uh, to bad hackers. Uh, and to foreign governments. So, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Kevin. I think certainly from uh, perhaps the government standpoint um, that uh, there is a need for them to hear from you and in partnership with other stakeholders that your voice is important in this discussion for precisely those reasons. So if there isn't an existing mechanism for that discussion to happen, um, then there needs to be one. And how do you create that in any particular um, jurisdiction may be differ from one to another. But I think there's ways to talk about that um, with some of us and others as well, how to, how to, how to create a, a vehicle for those discussions if they don't already exist. Uh, my name is Margion. I'm from NGO name IDULA, Indonesia Online Advocacy. Uh, I think we discussed uh, with the confused term between security and cybercrime. Uh, the impact of using term cybersecurity, or sometimes we use also cyber war, is that the, the state has legitimacy to limit the right of the people, the freedom. Uh, the civil liberty can be limited in time of war, in time of national security. So some issue we discuss here is about cyber crime, ordinary crime, not security. Uh, if, but in time of security, there is no uh, right of the people can be limited for stern extent for the name of national security. The word of Cybersecurity sometimes misleading. Is DDoS attack really concern related to national security, or it just a ordinary crime? And what time this can endanger the existence of a state, like Estonia attack several years ago? There is no impact on the existence of the state. No one die in cyber war. No one can be killed in cyber war. But if we use terms security, war, 
we use term war, and then we give legitimacy to state to make a repressive me measure and limited the right of the people. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your question. In order to maybe be a little um, efficient, if I'm going to borrow from one of the methods that um, one of the moderators used yesterday and take a few questions and perhaps our, our panelists could address them all in a final word before we uh, end the session, but certainly not the discussion. Is that a fair approach? Okay, so I have this gentleman in the front and two hands in the back there. Um, and is there one over here as well? We'll take the was in the the wo woman in the middle. Did you have a question as well? Okay, so go ahead. We'll take the three questions and 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 the one we've just heard for a lead up to a wrap up. Okay, guys. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. My name is Naveen Tandon, and I represent the Internet Service Providers Association of India. Uh, I'll just make a. a statement uh, and that's not a question and just to tell uh, where India is heading specifically there have been major thrust of late uh, in the areas of cyber security and there have been remarkable developments in terms of develop and forming a joint working group and which has never happened before with the industry co and, and civil society and technical collaboration so it's a truly multi-stakeholder advisory group which is about to be set up and there have been uh, discussions and four or five areas which you have all covered in your presentation relating to capacity building, certification, international cooperation which is about to happen. On the question, uh, my question is that uh, every country, every nation has a right to defend itself and develop necessary infrastructure to protect its cyber, its networks and its, uh, and its network. Uh, but how, in, when it comes to operationalize international cooperation and having engagement because cyber security has no as you know, does not knows any boundaries. They have no borders. So how the countries should collaborate with each other, given the fact that these are all security sensitive, there are issues of privacy, there are issues on IPRs. So any thoughts you can share uh, on how best to collaborate internationally as against, we have heard about international cooperation, but about international cooperation so that world across uh, we became uh, at least cyber secure from that perspective. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Hold that thought. And um, Bill, I, I don't know how to get it to you. Can you pass the microphone back to Bill and then I think Alejandro and... Sure. I'm uh, Bill Smith with PayPal. Um, first, I'd like to say that um, PayPal's view is that there is no privacy without security. Um, if we have no security, then we would be sending everything in the, uh, on the Internet in clear text, and the only way to then have maintain privacy would be to do nothing, send nothing of a personally identifiable nature. So our view is that they are, in fact, uh, you know, tied at the hip, really. You, you must have security in order to have privacy. Um, if I could quickly comment on the, the questions I think uh, earlier on liability and things like that and then also suggestions that we might not uh, we might not want to use DDoS uh, um, I won't say a weapon someone else used the weapon right? I can't come up with a better name but DDoS weapons to tool to test our products if we're going to be liable for products we need to be able to test them in an appropriate environment and if DDoS is, is something that could happen to us and it is it has happened to PayPal for example, we need to be able to test it in a real-world environment. So these things also go together. We also need to do penetration testing and everything, and lots of other things. Um, I'm hearing lots of you know, cybersecurity as a national security issue. At PayPal, we recognize that's an issue, but our issue is on the cybercrime side and also maintaining, you know, being a good privacy and uh, respecting entity. Um, so my question is to the panelists, right? We see security as enhancing privacy. And are there things that we should be doing in the security space, increasing security, that also enhance privacy? Thank you. Thank you. One last question. And really, um, I'm just trying to be considerate of the next session that will come in here. If you can keep your responses very, very brief and succinct and perhaps continue the conversation. Please, go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Um, because this is a IGF radio. <laughs> next, next, next year we will have uh, tin cans and uh, and strings. Uh, the brief comment, question. Uh, 
comment. Uh, la a couple of years ago, I mapped the evolution of the cybersecurity subject over several years of the IGF. Around 2010, it actually disappeared. Uh, it appeared that uh, powerful countries with uh, national controlling interests were more keen to take this to the UN General Assembly. It's now back. We have to ask ourselves, especially when we see governments pushing cybersecurity agendas in the IGF, uh, does it only mean increased interest or does it mean increased trust on the IGF and the participants? Do, is there more trust on the multi-stakeholder processes for cybersecurity or less? Uh, question to the friend from, to the colleague from the Caribbean. Uh, do you see more government involvement in the certs and CSIRTs? And in particular, do you see as critical uh, that they have communication powers to the police or law enforcement authorities so that they can actually start legal proceedings against criminals? Uh, cybersecurity, I agree with many other speakers, has to become a too broad term. We have to say cybersecurity for some governments is national security, and for some it's deliberately mixed up so that you can put in everything uh, that will excite people and uh, authorize governments o over intervention. And finally, to the multi-stakeholder question, uh, I would like to hear reactions to the idea that we have to have architectures of certs and CSIRTs in country particular or cross country. When you have totally private sectors uh, uh, certs like you have, uh, like Microsoft has mentioned, or you have a banking sector financial cert, and you have a national with access to the uh, to the law enforcement. And you have the standard academic, for example, which are usually very good in producing good people that then go to work in all the others. Thank you. Okay, the challenge is on for our panelists to um, touch on one or any any and all of the questions that were posed at the last moment while we wrap up. Um, Bevel, can I start with you? Ah, oh, thank you. Alejandro. To respond to your question in terms of what's happening in the Caribbean, uh, governments have actually been in an interesting turn of events, asked by private sector to play a leading role in establishing suits. Um, this is not sufficient, however, because government's piece of, of operation, sorry, government's piece of operation is not always um, ideal in terms of what is required. So you do have uh, the, the volunteer group, the NOG, looking seriously at its own role in helping deal with the issue of monitoring and, um, and tracking at a regional level, which of course is something that individual national sovereign governments will also not be um, exactly rushing to do regionally. Right, so. Kokan. Okay. Uh, the question, one of the questions was uh, related with DDoS attacks. Uh, uh, the comment was uh, that DDoS attacks may not fall under the uh, concern of national security. I don't agree with this view because uh, if, the, if these types of uh, attacks are directed uh, to critical infrastructures, for example, uh, public health system, uh, which is uh, provided uh, online in Turkey, for example, uh, so uh, every day millions of provisions uh, are uh, made uh, via these uh, systems and uh, if these systems uh, are under attack uh, under DDoS attacks uh, they won't be able to uh, serve to the patients and uh, I think uh, a government should uh, should be concerned with the uh, security of their uh, the citizens and uh, the provision of public services and uh, in such cases uh, DDoS attacks are uh, fall fall uh, under uh, national security concerns I think and uh, another question was about international collaboration uh, some ways uh, of this collaboration may be in researching inter international concepts regarding global threats I think and uh, we can look for multilateral uh, conventions on cooperation and forensic purposes uh, after the attacks, I think. Uh, yeah. And finally, uh, we can share uh, malware data, data databases and uh, uh, these, these ways of collaboration can prove useful instruments uh, in order to strengthen global information uh, security, I think. And uh, finally, with regard to the question uh, about 
privacy and security trade-off. Uh, I, I don't think uh, this tra trade-off is an inherent issue. I think uh, privacy uh, is a component of uh, is a component of liberty. Uh, excuse me. Security is a component of liberty, and if you look at the components of uh, information security, there are three components. You know, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And uh, in this respect, privacy uh, doesn't uh, conflict with security. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin and then Andrew. Oh, Kevin? Are you going to say anything? Oh, yeah. Uh, Turn on your mic. Oh. <laughs> um, in your question about how best to collaborate, I think that flexibility is key. Uh, decentralized over centralized, multi-stakeholder uh, over government dominated, voluntary rather than mandatory. And ultimately, I think based on many of the anecdotes I've read in cybersecurity situations, it often comes down to the building a personal network, having the personal relationships, being able to call, you know, from Bangalore, that guy in Seattle who knows that guy in Russia, when something is breaking, you know the right people who can help address it quickly, being agile. Privacy and security, secure communications tools foster not only human rights, but cybersecurity and protect against cybercrime. We need widespread SSL adoption, uh, on a much wider variety of web security tools. We need easier disk encryption tools. Thank you, Microsoft, for putting that in uh, uh, Windows 8. And especially, we need those tools for mobile devices. Thank you. Andrew, last word. Uh, last comment I would have is that security is a balancing act. You, know, you, heard, it, you heard it earlier. You're balancing between uh, national security and uh, privacy uh, or citizen rights. You're balancing between security and privacy. You're balancing between innovation and liability. Uh, the challenge for us is not to go to an extreme, but to use that tension to help deliver improved solutions across the board. That tension will actually improve uh, the solutions. Thank you all very much for your patience with our um time and apologies to the next crowd but uh, thank please join me in thanking our expert panelists here today <laughs>